we're going to do a, uh, a real quick review to uh, get to what we want to talk about and focus on primarily uh, this morning. And it's a passage, uh, oddly enough, in the book of Acts, Acts 27. We're going to look at that chapter here uh, after a bit, but we need to do a, a lead in. And a little bit of review uh, for those of us who are older and have a hard time remembering what we heard uh, an hour ago or especially a day ago. But we'll do a real quick review and then we'll, uh, we'll morph into this uh, study time and this discussion about a situation in Acts chapter 27 that has a lot to do with the theme of uh, hope in adverse circumstances. Whenever... Uh, I was asked to uh, be a part of this uh, Faith Builders experience this year. I was uh, assigned the subject of uh, finding hope after loss. And it's, I guess, primarily because I have a unique ministry called Widowhood Workshop. And that ministry is about helping to raise awareness about grief, uh, grief generally, not just grief from the loss of a spouse, but uh, about raising awareness in regard to grief dealing with not just the loss, but living with the reality of the loss the rest of your life. And then especially uh, trying to help uh, people who are uh, widowed, who have lost their spouse, to help them to build a new identity and uh, build a new life and develop a new character. Because that's what happens when we go through difficult times. Uh, we're changed. One of the uh, books I read after my wife passed away made this observation, and I think it's so true. No human being goes through crises without being changed. No human being goes through crises without being changed. If you have a crisis that you're experiencing, you're going to be changed by that crisis. It's going to have an effect on you. Now, the great thing about that is that though that initial effect that it has on you is to some degree out of your control, in the long run, the crises that we experience and the change that that has on us is within our control in the long run. In the short run, we're kind of at the mercy of our thinker and our feeler running wild. And we're struggling and we're feeling the stress and we're maybe dealing with the hopelessness that can uh, even factor into some really, really difficult crises. But whenever we go through a crisis, we're dramatically affected because we're human beings. We're not machines. And then what we have to do is learn to be resilient and think about this and then process what we're going through and decide what effect in the long run we're going to let what we've experienced have on us. And we are under, uh, under uh, that reaction or that change is under our control in the long run. In the short run, not so much. But in the long run, yes. I have a friend who uh, often says, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this? Well, I think that's a good question to ask when you're going through a, a crisis. And when you're trying to get a grip on yourself and you're trying to begin to be resilient and alter your life because of the change and the crisis you're going through, trying to decide what can I learn from this? And you can always learn from this. You can learn from everything that you experience, the good things and the bad things. So let's go, uh, go this way. We'll do a real quick review and talk about uh, finding hope after loss. Uh, hope is extremely valuable, but the problem is sometimes we experience things that cause us to feel hopelessness. Hopelessness is a feeling. <laughs> and remember, there's a difference between a feeling and a reality. Just because we feel something doesn't mean it's a reality. Uh, hopelessness is something that has an effect on us. It has an impact on us. It causes our thinker and feeler to go in overdrive. And a lot of times our feeler becomes the dominant thing that controls us for a while until we can get our thinker to get a grip. So what do we do when we're, it feels like drowning in our hopelessness because of a crisis that we're experiencing? We have to, have, have to have a reality check here and admit the fact that things in life can steal our hope. There are things that we can experience that can steal kinds of hope. To give you an example, how about when a person experiences a divorce? Okay, when they've experienced a divorce, what hope has been stolen from them? 
What hope do you have when you're at the altar and you say, I do? What is the hope? Till death do us part. That's the game plan, right? Yeah. And you have uh, ideas um, in regard to what you're going to do. Uh, you have a plan, don't you? Well, but then the marriage ends in divorce. Uh, the same thing is true when the marriage ends by, by death. You have got these hopes and dreams that you had that you've lost. Well, whenever you get a cancer diagnosis, what hope has been stolen from you when you, when you get a cancer diagnosis? What do we all hope for in regard to our health? A fruitful life. A fruitful life. Good health, right? That's what we hope for. Now, sadly, isn't it so often true that we don't appreciate our health until we lose it? Isn't that sad? That's a sad quality that we human beings uh, have had a tendency to permit ourselves to kind of drift into. This uh, attitude uh, or this perspective that we don't have a full-fledged, deep appreciation for what we have until we lose it. We shouldn't be that way. We don't have to be that way. We can be different. But when you get a cancer diagnosis, it's, uh-oh, what now? You've had hopes about your life. Now your hopes have been stolen, at least for a time. Your hopes have been stolen because you're overwhelmed with the fact that now you've got to deal with this cloud that's hanging over you. Am I going to be able to go into remission? Is there a way that I can be treated? And you begin to have all these thoughts and all these feelings and your hope, a kind of a hope, has been stolen from you. I think we have to concede that there are things that we experience that do steal our hope. Now, the good thing is they can't steal our Christian hope. Our Christian hope has to do with things that are eternal, things that are spiritual, things that are in the unseen world. That's where our Christian hope is. That kind of hope can't be touched by the experiences that we have in this life. Uh, please keep in mind the James Dobson observation. Uh, basically, you can't trust your emotions. You cannot let your emotions dominate you, and you cannot permit them to convince you that they are always consistent with reality because they're not. What happens sometimes when we experience difficult things in our life is we just feel like we're drowning. Even Job, a great man of faith, said that his days were spent without hope. He had a God in heaven who loved him, a God in heaven who was watching over him and caring for him, and yet that great man of faith got so extremely hopeless in regard to what was going on inside of him, he said he had no hope. He was not without hope because he had God. You're never without hope if you have God. But you see, that's the powerful impact of life circumstances on us. They can steal our hope put us into a hopeless state, but we have to recognize that our emotions are not always consistent with our reality. Even Job didn't realize that. Now, there is a hopeless state, and that's without Jesus. When you're without Jesus, there is a literal hopelessness. But that's a hopelessness without Christ. If you have Christ, if you have the Lord in your life, you're never in a hopeless situation. Because that hope has to do with the eternal and the invisible. When people in the first century lost uh, their loved ones, they were deeply concerned about the fact that they felt like they were missing out because the Lord hadn't come back yet. And if the Lord hadn't come back yet, then they were thinking that their loved ones were missing out. And the Apostle Paul says, no, that's not true. You go ahead and sorrow and you grieve, but don't grieve as those who have no hope. See, he admits the fact that there can be a sense of sorrow and grief, but yet at the same time, that's not without hope. When we're Christians, we always have hope. You have to fight the feeling, the, fight the feeling of hopelessness. You do that with self-control. You convert yourself into thinking that you can get back up on your feet again, that this is not the end of the world. Now, it may feel the end of the world, but it's not the end of the world. So what we have to do is work on our self-control, our self-restraint. We've got to tone down the drive of our thinker and our feeler that has caused us to feel so overwhelmed. Self-control is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's also a part of what should grace our lives as Christians. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We always, as Christians, have hope. Now, our circumstances can be bad. They can cause us to feel hopeless, but we are not without hope if we are Christians. The book of Colossians talks a lot about that, about how that we have hope, but that hope is spiritual. It's laid up for us in heaven. It's a hope we have because the Lord is living in our life. We always have hope. Now, that's not always how we feel, but that's always the reality. That's always the truth. Sometimes what we've got to do is we've got to keep coaching ourselves, keep reminding ourselves, this is not the end of the world. This is a difficult circumstance. I have hope. You have negative feelings, but you always have hope. The value of hope is that it inspires and it motivates us. But there's different kinds of hope. There's a common hope, a worldly hope. You know, people buy a lottery ticket for what reason? What do they hope? To win money. That they win money. Yeah. Uh, there's an uncommon hope. Both of them are in the Bible. Uh, Herod had a common hope. He wanted to see a miracle, but he didn't see the miracle. Uh, Felix bribed Paul, hoping to get what he wanted, but he didn't get what he wanted. He tried to bribe Paul. Paul had a hope to visit shortly. You know, sometimes we have hopes to do certain things, to go certain places, to experience certain things, but they don't happen. See, a common hope, a worldly hope, is like a wish or a desire. Both the wish and desire of a human being, that kind of hope is mentioned in the Bible. But there's also an uncommon hope. That uncommon hope is very different. Now, the hope in the New Testament, that word is found 85 times. Five times in the Gospels, 10 times in the book of Acts, 70 times in the letters in the New Testament. The uncommon hope is a confident expectation. That's what we as Christians have. We have that confident expectation no matter what we're experiencing, no matter how we feel. We have to keep telling ourselves that because our thinker and our feeler can run wild because of the experiences that we're having in our life, our hope. And I loved how this was brought out yesterday. Our hope is not in our family, as much as I love my family. Our hope is not in our family. It's not in our job. It's not in our doctor. It's not in our health. Our hope as Christians is in God. That hope cannot be touched by any ugly, awful circumstance this side of eternity. It cannot be. It's a confident expectation that has to do with things spiritual. Our hope's in the Lord. Our hope is what motivates us and inspires us to keep being faithful to the Lord. And what is uh, odd about the struggles of life is the struggles of life and the suffering we go, for, go through can actually help us to create hope. Where could I go but to the Lord? You know, when you have a circumstance in your life where you come to the realization that there is nothing else but the Lord to help you, when you feel that desperation and that tremendous need, the blessing that's involved in that is that desperation can cause you to seek the Lord with a greater passion than you ever had before in your life. Is it all bad when we suffer bad, but yet sense a tremendous need for God, more so than we've ever had before? If us going through difficult times causes us to be brought to our knees and causes us to seek the Lord more fervently, is it all bad? No, it's not. There is a, uh, are any, uh, any of you familiar with a lady, a young lady who sings uh, Lori, Laura Story is her name, Laura Story. She uh, sings a song about what if it's through your teardrops that you come to a closer relationship with the Lord. What if a thousand sleepless nights, a part of one of the lyrics that she sings, what if a thousand sleepless nights causes you to be closer to the Lord? Sometimes our blessings come through raindrops. 
And sometimes the blessings come in the midst of a storm. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, thank you for asking that question yesterday, Keith. <laughs> Hope is simply faith directed to the future. There's a connection between faith and hope. When we have faith, we can have hope. And that hope is the faith that we have about the future. Now, a cancer patient hopes to go into remission. But what if that cancer patient doesn't go into remission? What hope do they still have? Hope in God. Hope in God. What if they were to die because of the cancer? Do they still have hope? They have God. They have hope. If we have God, we always have hope, no matter what our feelings are, no matter what our circumstances are. The trouble is, sometimes we lose it because of the circumstances. The way to find it is to find God, to seek God with a greater passion. That's how you restore your hope. That's how you find your hope. But we have to realize that the hope that we have is a living hope that has to do with spiritual things, with eternal things. Sometimes our wishes or our desires are not going to be fulfilled this side of eternity. What we've got to realize is that our hope as Christians has to do with the unseen, the spiritual, and the eternal. A warning is only as good as the company behind it. Who's behind your hope? If God is behind your hope, if he's the object of your hope, if he's the source of your hope, see, that's the guarantee. We can have confidence because God is the source of our hope. God is the object of our hope. Hope is only as good as the one who is behind it. Our hope is not just about a feeling. It's about a confident expectation that comes from God, is because of God, and its object is God. But sometimes it's hard to remember that God's faithful. People are not always faithful. One of the reasons why, I think in the book of Malachi, the prophet said that God hates divorce is because what divorce is, it's a reflection of unfaithfulness. There is a tremendous struggle that we have sometimes having confidence in people who have let us down. When that confidence is broken, it's extremely hard to restore that confidence. Now, if we go through life and we have on occasion experienced people who are unfaithful to us, friends who are unfaithful to us, children who are unfaithful to us, spouses who are unfaithful to us, it causes us to have a hesitancy about trusting anybody. But see, God's faithful. See, a relationship with God is different than a relationship with a person. A person can let you down. A person can betray you. A person can be unfaithful to you. God is always faithful. See, our hope, that's why our hope is a confident expectation. Because that confident expectation is rooted in God and our relationship with God is something we can be confident about because of him and because of his grace to forgive us when we struggle on our side of the relationship. If there's a problem between us and God, who has the issue? It's not God, it's us. That's why you can always have hope when your hope is directed toward God, when God is the source of your hope. We sing this song sometimes. Great is your faithfulness. Whose faithfulness? The Lord's faithfulness. The Lord is the, my portion and my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Notice the connection between God's faithfulness and then the hope and the quality of that hope. The quality of that hope is absolutely a confident expectation. It's not just a desire or a wish. It's a confident expectation because God is faithful. Our circumstances sometimes let us down, sometimes scare us, but God does not let us down. He is faithful. Now, I want to spend some time in Acts chapter 27. 
give me a circumstance, give me a life circumstance that would be viewed by us more mortal human beings as a hopeless circumstance. Yeah, they demotion at a job. What do you say? A demotion. A at demotion a, at a job. Or how about a dismissal? A demotion or a dismissal from a job. Yeah. Especially if that job's become a big deal to you, you know, kind of morphed into a part of your identity, maybe even your entire identity. Sometimes that happens. Well, I've worked for the state of Washington for twenty years and I got demoted by a supervisor. Mm -hmm. And I felt it was totally unjust and stuff. And that yeah, I've had to work for this supervisor for an additional 10 years since then. Mm. Yeah, that would bite. Yeah, and that has an effect on you, doesn't it? Now, it's nothing eternal. Okay. Now, uh, did your eternity was not threatened by that. It, your hope, your eternal hope was not threatened by that experience. You know, the hope that we have as Christians is not about our job or our ability to stick with the same job or our ability to climb the ladder with the job. Our hope as Christians is all about the unseen, the spiritual, and the eternal. Uh, give me another hopeless circumstance. Keith? Um, I was tractor trailer driving for Domino's National Commissary and I had a wreck and I got fired. And that was in you were driving for Domino's? Yeah, National Commissary, where they supplied the pizza stores. Yeah. And I Did had, you get free pizza? I could have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, so you drove for them, you had a wreck. Yeah, and I got fired. And you got fired. Yeah. Hmm. So what are you going to do? You know, that was the way that you uh, took care of your physical needs and the physical needs of other people. And now, you know, especially with a record, with when you've got something like that that's happened, um, I, I know someone who, uh, a Christian, went to a Christian college, uh, was married to a Christian, uh, had a child, but uh, dealt with uh, clinical depression. Clinical depression is a real difficult affliction. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Uh, clinical depression is no more to be ashamed of than having a cancer diagnosis or a Parkinson's diagnosis, diagnosis, diagnosis or an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Clinical depression just is. Um, and the vast majority of times it has to do with a chemical imbalance. It's nothing to be ashamed of. But this person self-medicated their hopeless situation, their sense of hopelessness, they self-medicated with alcohol, and then eventually with meth. Ended up serving a good bit of jail time. Ended up eventually, when uh, violating uh, parole, uh, ended up three years in a state pen. Now, remember, I started when I said he was a Christian. He went to a Christian school. And that's a bad situation because once you go to, the, to prison, you lose your source of self-medication, so you got to figure something out. And if you don't, you just continue in your depression. Yeah. And when you get out of prison and you're trying to find a job and you have to reveal the fact that you are a felon, you know, it can be pretty hopeless. Uh, just the other day, I met somebody who uh, had a reconnected with somebody who uh, has a, a felony record, and she said that it has been very difficult to get a job. Uh, she tried to get a job at Walmart and was turned down. Her father told me that Walmart brags about the fact that they hire felons. I did not know that. But one thing I have been impressed with when I've been in Walmart is how many people who are to some degree handicapped that they do hire. I think that's very commendable. But what uh, this woman found out was that she would not be hired by Walmart because she had a felony record. You know, there's some things that we have done in the past that we're accountable for that create, just like sometimes we're our own worst enemy, and we can kind of create our hopeless circumstance. And it can be very, not just frustrating, you can feel so hopeless that it drives you to behave in ways that are unnatural, 
uh, ways that you do not uh, typically act, ways that sometimes you don't even want to. You know, you just struggle sometimes with knowing what's right, but yet at the same time not doing what's right, and then feeling bad because you're not doing what's right. And all that confliction that goes on inside of you can create this sense of hopelessness. Life circumstances can become so negative that they create this sense of hopelessness. Well, in uh, this particular section of Acts chapter 27, it's a boat scene. And I want to pick up with this story, and we're not going to read the entire chapter. It's well worth a good bit of study time. But in this particular chapter, in uh, chapter 27, Paul and some other people are on this boat. They're headed to Italy. Now, I want you to notice that uh, there are a number of things that are mentioned about these circumstances. In verse 9, in Acts 27 and verse 9, there's a word there that is kind of like a red flag word about the circumstances. What we're going to do is we're going to look for words or phrases about the circumstance of these people in this boat. Okay, in verse 9, what's the word that's the red flag word? Dangerous. The sailing was now dangerous. Okay, now uh, go to uh, verse 14. Verse 13 says, A south wind blew softly. But then it says in verse 14, what are some words that raise concern? Hurricane force. Hurricane force. Tempestuous headwind arose. Now drop down to verse 16. How stressed did these people get on the boat? What did they feel compelled to do in verse 16? Get in the lifeboats. Secured the skiff with difficulty. Okay, when you're dealing with an ugly, difficult circumstance, and you're addressing it to the best of your ability, but things aren't getting any better, what happens to your blood pressure? What happens in your armpits to get really ugly about it? You start sweating. You know, because it's a tense situation, you start getting stressed. So here they are in this boat. Now, by the way, has anybody here ever been in a boat when it was really rough seas, rough water? Big ship, yeah. A big ship? Yeah. Did it shake the big ship even? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've uh, talked to a few people who've been on a cruise. Uh -huh. I don't have an interest in going on a cruise. Uh, unless it's Alaska. I'd risk it going up to Alaska. But um, it amazes me that you've got this big honking ship yeah. and how turbulent the water could get to such a degree that a big honking ship like that could be so dramatically effective. Yeah. It, it amazes me. Uh, you think anybody gets scared? I did. You did? <laughs> I did yeah. You did? Yeah. Wasn't your hope in the Lord? At that moment, no. <laughs> At that moment, no. I, I appreciate that. And that is exactly what we need to understand. You know, we're human beings. You know, there are times that we are going to struggle. We're going to be so overwhelmed that our faith in the Lord is not, we're going to feel like our faith in the Lord is not enough. Because we're just that concerned. We're that overwhelmed. Um, look here again. Drop down to verse 18. What does it say in verse 18 about the storm and what's going on here? Exceedingly what? Tossed. tossed. Battered. It, battered. Battered. Exceedingly tempest-tossed. Battered. Well, how bad does it get in verse 19? <laughs> they start throwing the tackle overboard. Now, I'm, I'm thinking at this point, they're sweating bullets. They are really struggling with this very difficult uh, life circumstance. <clears throat> now, imagine what it was like being in rough seas and struggling the way they were. And imagine the feelings and the thoughts that the people on the boat were experiencing. Well, they probably wish they had listened to Paul to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> because, good point, because if you look at verse 10, 
He says, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss. Yeah, uh, it's not like they were clueless, uh, but what Paul said kind of went in one ear and out the other. So here they are on this ship. Now, the only thing that I've come close to in regard to this is I was on a pontoon boat with a family uh, up in Ohio on a, uh, on a lake, uh, Tappan Lake, and uh, I'd been on a pontoon before. My father had an old pontoon. I, he didn't pay much at all for it. I'm surprised it floated. But I'd been on that pontoon a number of times and in no way felt ever threatened. But on this particular pontoon that belonged to this other family, uh, this guy uh, walked to the front of the uh, pontoon and the front of the pontoon started going underwater. Well, immediately, <clears throat> uh, my whole family was on that pontoon as well as uh, him and his wife. And when that happened, immediately, uh, there was a bunch of us who walked backwards to lift the front of the pontoon. That was scary because I just thought, what is what in the world's going to happen? And immediately what happens is, you know, your your feeler takes control and, and your thinker is running real fast too. And both of them are running very fast in negative directions. So you immediately try to adjust to make things better. Well, they're on this ship headed to Italy and everything they're doing, they're, they're trying to resolve this issue. They're trying to find some peace. They're trying to find some safety. Now notice, keep going, look at verse 20. Now when the sun nor stars appeared, what's it say? For many days. How many is many? One. Too many. More than right. one. Can you imagine? Is this, does it ever get this way in the Northwest? You know, I have heard for years it rains all the time up here, and I haven't seen a drop of rain since I got here. You should have been here last month. <laughs> oh, it doesn't rain that much. Yeah, I should have been here last month. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So I'll have to come back uh, in, May, in, in May. June then. Okay. Like call us the evergreen state. The evergreen state. Yeah. Ever cloudy state is what I heard. <laughs> but now imagine, now just imagine, try to put yourself in this position. Now, neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us. Now, watch the rest of the verse. Given up. Yes, sir. Keith, that's exactly what it says. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. They tried their best to rectify the situation, and it wasn't working. It was a hopeless situation. Uh, how many of you saw the movie Perfect Storm? Okay, several of you did. Uh, George Clooney. And I really enjoyed that movie. It ended in a different way than I had anticipated. Um, I can't believe they killed off George Clooney. But he was the last to go, uh, so I guess that was appropriate. But, you know, they, the computer graphics in that movie were very good. And the way they presented the threat, the tempestuous nature of what they were experiencing, uh, very, it seemed to me very, very realistic. And they just kept trying everything they possibly could to keep themselves afloat in, in a just a scary, scary situation. In the end, they died. They all died. Um, I didn't expect the movie to end that way. I expected George Clooney to survive. I really did. What's the point? Yeah. And, see, hope less less. Sometimes we get in circumstances where the best we try to do and all that we give to try to make something better, it doesn't get better. Sometimes that happens. It's a good thing our hope has to do with the afterlife. Our hope has to do with the unseen. Our hope has to do with something outside this world because in this world, there are things that we can experience that can seem to us to be hopeless. And it might be in a common sort of a way, a hopeless kind of situation. It may never get better this side of eternity. But you see, that doesn't steal the hope that we have because the source of our hope is God. And the source of our hope has to do with the spiritual and the unseen. 
Uh, David, you're going to say something? Well, I just want to, on a, do we have any indication as of without the storm, how long this would have been a normal sailing? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't done research about that. I'm not sure about that. Uh, look here, after it says all hope in verse 20, that we should be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood up in the midst of them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this. Now watch the words, disaster and loss. See, when we experience disaster and loss, that has an effect on us. It can steal our hope. You know, the fear, uh, the anxiety, the worry that we have that goes with some circumstances that we experience can be extremely difficult for us to handle because we're just mere mortal human beings. There are things that we can do and there are things that we cannot do. And so it's natural that there are times that we would struggle with hopelessness, that we would feel like we've lost our hope. What we've got to understand is that in regard to our hope, there are two kinds of hope. There's hope that has to do with this world, that's just a wish or a desire. Then there's the hope that has to do with eternity, which is the more valuable hope, which is our Christian hope, our biblical hope, and that cannot be threatened by any negative circumstance this side of eternity. Now, watch, because I think Paul is a tremendous example here. Watch in this story, picking up at verse 22. And now I urge you to take heart. See, all hope was gone it said at the end of verse 20. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve. Now, one of the things that we've got to remind ourselves about whenever we're struggling with our hope and we feel like we've lost our hope, We've got to realize whose we are. Who am I? I'm the Lord's. I am a child of God. We've got to coach ourselves. We've got to self-coach ourselves. We've got to remind ourselves that no matter what we experience in this life, we are the Lord's. Have you ever heard somebody, I'll bet some of you, I don't know if you'd admit it or not. I'll bet some of you have said, I've got this. You know, that's a, I have a, my youngest daughter says that to me. She says that to me to aggravate me because she knows that when I hear her say that, I get concerned. When she says, Dad, I've got this, I, I just uh, become very concerned. She just does it to tease me. Now, let me reframe your thinking about that. I don't think it's a very good thing to say, I've got this. Now, I know, why do we say that? Why do we say to people, I've got this? Yeah, we want to instill confidence in them, not to be concerned about us. You know, I've got this. Now, let me explain to you a different way of looking at things. I think a way better way for us who are Christians to look at it is say this. God's got this. I've got God. This is going to be okay. Now, you see the humility in that, and you see the dependence in that kind of philosophy. It's not, I've got this. You know, that really is kind of an arrogant thing to say. You know, as if I was in total control. You ain't in total control. There's very little within your control. But how about God? If God's got this, and we have that faith, our faith is in his faithfulness. God's got this. I've got God. I'm God's. I belong to the Lord. This is going to be okay. Now, when is it going to be okay? I don't know. Next month? Uh, I hope maybe later on today. But it may not be until I draw my last breath. But it is going to be okay. It is always going to be okay. Never an exception. See, that's that confident expectation. God's got this. I've got God. This is going to be okay. That doesn't mean we're not going to struggle, though. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I had several examples of this, but one of my most enjoyable examples of this, uh, I was going to Lubbock, and there was a lightning storm on the plane, and I am fascinated by them. So I just love them. And, Me too. And they were, and that was the closest I've ever been to one. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just so surreal and so beautiful, and I'm just like loving it. And in the background, I'm hearing all these people, they're just like flipping out around me. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow, this is so cool. I have a window seat. I've got the front row seat to this. And they go, we could get hit. I said, yeah, we could. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like, we could die. And I said, that's okay. I'm close to where I want to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like there is something wrong with her. But oh, it was like yeah. the most gorgeous thing mm -hmm. I had ever seen up close and personal. And I was, I just was not with them. And they, and it was like, you could hear it was like people rethinking their thought process because there was this crazy girl over here just enjoying yeah. the way. <laughs> can't land and she's like oh I can just stay here forever until my ship's up wrong with her but it was I was comforted because the Lord had that yeah. and I was and look at Paul look at Paul's response in this threatening situation take heart men for I believe God see that's the key to finding your hope faith Hope is faith about the future. Take heart, men. I believe in God that it will be just as it was told me. Now, what has the Lord told you in his book that will give you confidence that what you're experiencing in the way of negativity is going to be okay? Think about the things he has promised you, the things he has told you. Yes, ma'am, you go ahead. Answer question first. Think of all, all the people in the Bible who had experienced loss, something, and you know, and the story in the Bible to show us, you know, that even though God allows things to happen or something they brought on themselves, you know, that it, it always ends up okay, you know, in one way or another. And I was just thinking, um, when I worked um, at a different job, a friend of mine, she was a Christian, which was wonderful in that time, and she and I had this paper, I laid it. Edit, and she wrote down faith, and I was like, okay, but the acronym is just said faith is a fantastic adventure in trusting him. Oh, a fantastic adventure in trusting him. In trusting him. And That's a good way of looking at life. You know, and, and when you're going through hard things, the things that we're talking about, the sessions are wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really, you know, when things get hard, you know, and you're like, God's brought me this far, he wouldn't leave me, but... That, that's when Satan gets really busy. He's just throwing that, you know, are you mm -hmm. sure you can trust God? Are you sure, you know, mm -hmm. God loves you kind of thing? But yeah. it's, it's, it goes along with Christian maturity. It takes time to process the loss and really, yeah. you know, how, how do you turn that around? And to build the confidence. Uh, yeah, uh, the angel told him in verse 24, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. See, that's what he was believing. He was told by an angel of God that he was going to arrive safely, that everybody in that boat was going to be okay. Now, no promise about the boat. Okay, the ship, uh, it's going to end in disaster for the ship. But he was going to get there. And even though there were threatening waves, and even though there was super stressing, he said, I believe in God that's going to be the way he told me. Now, what has God told you in his book? that's going to be calming and help you to have hope despite your negative circumstances. Yes, sir. The scripture that tells us, I will never forsake you. I love that verse. Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with us, his presence. You know, the presence of the creator of the world, the presence of the God who loves you more than anybody else, the omnipotent, the all-powerful, almighty God, present in your life gives you hope but see he resides in eternity see again see this hope that we have this confident expectation is because of an unseen world because of an unseen God but that unseen God is as real as the seat you're sitting in or the Bible you may be holding in your hand 
Just because we can't see something doesn't mean that it's not certain. By faith, we know that things are certain. He said, I believe in God. Uh, do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that God has told you that he will take care of you? He will provide for you. Do you believe in his providence that he will work all things together for good? If we love God, God's going to work things together for good. Providence. Providence is, I think, more amazing than the miracles. In the book of Esther, here's this Esther uh, who God uses providentially to save the Jewish world, to save the Jewish people. When they were looking in the very face of genocide, and yet there's no miracle that's performed in the book of Esther. God's name's not even in the book of Esther, but yet you can see him working behind the scenes in saving his people, stopping that genocide experience, but he works providentially. Do you believe in the providential working of God? That God will provide for you what you need when you need it. You know, one of the things that I often pray for people I'm concerned about is I often pray that God will bless them with the people and the experiences they need to help them to be faithful. Bless them with the people and the experiences they need to help them to be faithful. Now, sometimes that's a scary prayer because sometimes the experiences people need are come to Jesus meetings. Sometimes threatening circumstances, maybe even tragedies. You know, when you stop to think about what did it take Pharaoh to finally convince him to let the people go? Loss of his son. Ten. Ten plagues. I was sitting in a Bible class one time in West Tennessee and I raised my hand just kind of playing with everybody. And I said, hey, I said, if Pharaoh was a female, how many plagues would it have taken to change her mind? One lady said immediately, one. But Pharaoh was a man, so it took 10. It took 10 miracles to convince him to let the people go. God can work miraculously. We've seen that in scripture. But God also nowadays works providentially. Do we believe in the providence of God, that God can work things together for good? The God to whom I belong. See, we belong to the Lord. Whom I serve. When we serve the one to whom we belong, there's no need for us to be afraid. Because God will be faithful to his promise. Now, in Paul's regard, that promise was that he would be brought before Caesar. And that other people also would be saved. But that was a promise that was made. And Paul believed in that promise. It wasn't a hopeless circumstance. The hardest times often lead to the greatest moments of your life. Keep going. <clears throat> Sometimes we have to keep going when we feel hopeless. But just because we feel hopeless doesn't mean we're without hope. Because our hope isn't about a mere feeling, a mere wish or desire. It's about the unseen world. It's about eternal things. It's about spiritual things. What I think we have to be real uh, honest about is admit the fact that when we suffer loss, whether it's the loss of our health, uh, the loss of our job, the loss of finances, the loss of loved ones, when we suffer loss, it affects us. And we have to concede the fact that sometimes suffering loss can take us to a hopeless place. What we have to do is find our hope in that hopeless place. Let me read to you a couple sections out of this book. This book is called How to Go on Living When Someone You Love Dies. Grief is not just sadness or depression. It is a whole host of emotions, ranging from anxiety to anger to guilt to confusion to relief and more. Besides affecting your emotions, it reaches into every part of your life, touching your work, your relationships with others, and your image of yourself. She says, you can expect grief to have an effect on you psychologically, socially, and physically. I would add to that spiritually. You can expect grief, what we 
live after loss. You can expect grief to have an effect on you psychologically, socially, physically, and again, I would add spiritually. We need to accept that fact, deal with that reality, admit our need for help, and realize that that help, first and foremost, comes from the Lord. The source of our hope is the Lord, not our circumstances, not our family, not our finances, not the home we live in, not our age. Our hope is in God. The hardest times often lead to the greatest moments of your life. But we've got to keep going. Uh, comment, observation? I know dealing with this subject is, is uh, again, not popular. Sometimes makes people feel uncomfortable, but yet you exposed yourself to it, and I really appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible to get the slides? 